Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, Trumpkins. Today I am speaking to Scott Adams. Scott was the most requested defender of our commander in chief. He um, quite happily was willing to come on the podcast, and we had a very civil and enjoyable conversation. If anyone was triggered, it was me. I was Scott certainly sounded like the the meditator. I am perpetually triggered by our president, but I really enjoyed it. And I'll let you be the judge of whether Scott answered all the questions I I put to him. I think there were moments where he might have hypnotized me, and I just moved on to um, other topics. But anyway, thank you, Scott, for coming on. It was a worthy experiment to try to talk about all this. Scott, if you don't know him, though many of you surely do, is the creator of Dilbert, one of the most popular comic strips of all time. And he's done this full-time since 1995. Before that, he worked for 16 years at various companies from which he has mined all this material for Dilbert. And he's written best-selling books about Dilbert. All his cartoons have been wrapped up, but he's also written a book that I have been reading, which we really didn't talk about at all in this interview, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. And this is a book that is filled with life advice, and it is good advice insofar as I've read it thus far. Uh, and he has another book coming out, which really is the substance of our conversation, but that book is, is not out yet. It'll be out in October. You can pre-order it on Amazon. The title is Win Bigly, persuasion in a world where facts don't matter. And Scott and I gave it a good hard try to converge on questions about persuasion with respect to Trump and just how much facts matter. We probably have a different view of some crucial facts. I think we care about things or at least weight our preferences a little differently here. It's hard for me to explain, honestly, how we still see the situation as differently as we appear to. But this really was an attempt on my part to see the world through the eyes of someone who is a Trump supporter, at least to the degree that that Scott is. And again, even that isn't totally clear to me. I I may have been hypnotized, Scott. Uh, So uh, listen, this was fun, and I hope you enjoy it. I now give you Scott Adams. I am here with Scott Adams. Scott, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Now, you are a a very interesting guy who has written a very interesting book that uh, I will have properly described in the intro to the show. And I'll I'll link to it on my website, obviously, and people can get it there. We're not really going to get into your life or your other work unless it becomes relevant to the political discussion we're planning to have. But I'll just tell our listeners that, that I've been reading your book. That the title is How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. And it's very interesting. It's very, it's very useful and, and surprising. And our conversation will not do it justice at all today. Uh, but I encourage people to get the book because you give a lot of good advice about how to get what you want out of life. I haven't finished it yet, but it's, thus far it's advice that I agree with. I just I just want to heap some praise on you before we move on to other topics. Thank you. Let, let me just uh, put some context on that. The book you're talking about is essentially how to program yourself to be more successful in whatever way you want. But the new one that's already available for pre-order is about how to persuade other people. It's called Win Bigly, and it'll be out in October. Oh, cool. So now, now that is a book I'm sure we will be getting some preview of in this conversation, because that obviously relates to what we're going to be talking about. And uh, I'll I'll put a link to that as well on my blog. Okay, so let let me just set up this conversation so that everyone understands the context. As our listeners will be quite aware, I've been attacking Trump uh, really since before the election. So it's it's safe to say I'm not a fan. I'm sure I'll have some more impertinent things to say about El Presidente over the course of this next hour. But I've encountered a fair amount of criticism from people in my audience who like Trump, or at the very least feel that he was the best choice we had for president in 2016. And 
many of these people have been complaining that I've created an echo chamber here on the podcast because I've, I've only been talking to Trump's detractors. And I, I certainly can see how they might think that. I, you know, Although I've pointed out that the people I've been speaking with who criticize Trump have been Republicans for the most part. So the idea that these conversations have been an expression of political partisanship doesn't make any sense. There's, there's really zero partisanship coming from someone like David Frum or, or Ann Applebaum or me, for that matter, on this topic. Because, you know, for instance, none of what I've said about Trump would apply to Mitt Romney. And I've also never been shy about pointing out all the terrible things about Hillary Clinton. So if, if it's been an echo chamber, it hasn't been a, a left wing one. But in the meantime, I've been asking Trump supporters for months who I should bring on the podcast to represent the other side of the story and to help me recover from this much-diagnosed Trump derangement syndrome, which many people say I have, uh, and I, I, I appear to have a whopping case of it. And you are the person who has been most often recommended to me, so I just would congratulate you on that score. Well, thank you. There's a lot of pressure on me, but okay. So I, I want to say one other thing at the outset just to set the table here, because I've been seeing a, a few crazy comments online from obviously Trump supporters anticipating this podcast and wondering whether or not I would be fair to you. And um, so I just want to tell you how I view conversations like this and, and also tell our listeners. And I'm, I'm telling you now something that I, that I tell most of our guests. I don't think I've ever left it in an interview. And I, this is certainly something I, I tell any guest with whom I'm likely to disagree. I don't do gotcha interviews. My goal is never to get you to say something that makes you look bad. In fact, if at any point in this conversation you put your foot in your mouth or I put my foot in there, you should feel free to take it out and we'll cut that part out. And this, this could apply to a whole section of the conversation. So if we get onto a topic for five minutes and then you say at the end, you know, you know what, that whole bit we just did on racism or whatever, I'm worried about how that's going to make me look. Well, then we will just cut it. So, you know, we can edit as we go, if need be. Because my goal is always, and again, this doesn't just apply to you. This applies to anyone who comes on this podcast. My goal is always to be dealing with the best version of the other person's case. I want you to be happy with what you've said on the podcast. So this is the opposite of a gotcha interview. And I don't think many people understand that. And, and having been on the other side of literally hundreds of interviews at this point, and I, as I know you have, I, th I think we both can say that almost no one operates this way. Journalists deliberately don't because they want to reserve the right to catch you saying something embarrassing. I mean, it's a completely perverse ethic that, that seems to have been enshrined in journalism, where if you say something is off the record before you say it, well, then they will generally keep it off the record. But if you say that about something you regret saying just two seconds ago, something that didn't come out right, then they won't let you take it off the record after the fact. This has always struck me as a, a less than ethical way to deal with people and their ideas. Yeah, I agree. Um, but uh, wouldn't worry about me because uh, like you, I've, I've done a few of these. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just want you to know that. And I want our listeners to know that. I guess the other thing I should say a setup is that, you know, while I think you and I will disagree about a lot here, I, I don't view this as a debate. I mean, I, I consider myself genuinely persuadable on certain points and genuinely ignorant of other points. Now, it's true that there's some things where I, I don't really see how you could conceivably change my mind. I mean, if you're going to argue that Trump doesn't lie, for instance, that's going to be a very difficult thing to sell to me. But I genuinely count myself ignorant of how people find him appealing. So I, I view part of your job in this conversation as really educating me on how that is possible. I guess to start, what I'd like to do is, is just to have you clearly state what your view is of Trump, because it hasn't been entirely clear to me how much you actually support him beyond just admiring his talent as a persuader. Much of what I've seen you say about him is more in the vein of explaining how Trump got elected. And it's not really an argument that his election was a good thing or that he's a good person or that he's likely to be a good president. So just what is your view of Trump at this point? Well, I should tell your listeners, first of all, that I have a background as a trained hypnotist, and I've been studying the field of persuasion all of my adult life as part of my job. It's part of what a writer does, part of what a cartoonist needs. 
So when I saw uh, Trump enter the race, I noticed fairly quickly he had the strongest set of persuasion skills I've ever seen. He has what I call a a skill stack, a complementary set of skills that if you looked at any one of those skills, you'd say, well, that's good. That's better than most people, but that's not any world-class particular special skill. But when you put them together, they're insanely effective, you know, as we can see, because he's president. Uh, he made it, you know, against all odds. And my view on the politics of it is that my political preferences didn't align with either side in the election. Uh, I consider myself an ultra liberal on social stuff, meaning that even liberals don't recognize me because I'm more liberal than liberals. I could give you some examples of that to, to fill that in if you want. Uh, and then on the big stuff, you know, the international stuff, the how, to, how do you beat ISIS and what's the best thing to do with North Korea? Uh, my view is that none of us really know the answer to that because we don't have the information that government would have uh, and we don't have the, the full context that they have. So generally, I don't have a firm position on the big international stuff and on the smaller uh, local stuff the domestic stuff. Uh, I'm in favor of people doing whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't affect me. So I, again, I, I, sh I should say that I, I haven't seen everything or read everything you've said on, on this topic. I've read some of your blog posts and I've seen some of your Periscope videos, which you've been doing quite regularly about Trump. But it seems to me that you you are sort of having it both ways here, because you, you seem to delight in his ability to get away with doing at least questionable things. I mean, I would say bad things, but I mean, certainly dishonest things, because you admire his talent as a persuader. But to my eye, very quickly begins to seem like a defense of the bad things he's doing, or at least a denial that they are bad, or, or a denial that he's doing any harm to our civil discourse and to our politics by lying to the degree that he does. So. Where, where does your appreciation of the artistry grade into actually thinking he is good and liable to do good things? The way I like to frame it is that I'm helping people see him clearly without the filter that the opposition is putting on him. Because he has a, a set of skills and a, a talent that we've never seen before, meaning that nothing like this has ever you know, been in the political uh, realm that we've seen. So what he can do is probably different from what a regular politician can do, both on the upside and the downside, I would think. So I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, discounting that there's greater risk with a President Trump than a, some you know, vanilla president. Uh, but I think his supporters have said explicitly and often, we'll take the risk, we'll take the chaos. Um, that's the price of change. So uh, there's a lot of that that his supporters accept, and I see my my role in this as clarifying. And if they like that choice, if that's a risk profile that they appreciate, then at least they can see it a little more clearly. Now let me let me speak about the 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 lying part because I I think that's probably central to your problem. W would you say that's true? Yeah, yeah. So here's how I frame that: it is unambiguously true and it is clear to both his supporters and his critics that he says things fairly frequently that do not pass the fact checks. Uh, and you would agree with that, right? So we're, I think we're starting from the same factual starting point. It understates it for me, but yes, that, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> now, obviously, obviously, his supporters would say, well, that one thing he said wasn't so wrong. You know, so there'd be lots of disagreement in the gray areas. But there's no question that there are a lot of things he said that don't pass the fact checking and everybody agrees with that. Here's the part that I put on top of this that I think is helpful. When, when you understand persuasion at the level that he does and at the level that I've come to understand it through my own work over the years, uh, the truth is not, uh, is not as useful <laughs> as, I guess that's the best way to put it, it's not as useful as it should be because it doesn't change people's minds. And the job of politics is often to change people's minds, their hearts, their emotions, what they care about, what their priorities are. So if you, if you were to look at the types of things 
that the president has said that didn't pass the fact checking, and that's the way I'll, I, I'm going to prefer to say it, is uh, they are almost always emotionally true, or they are emotionally compatible with what his um, his supporters are already thinking. So there is an emotional and directional truth to what he does that's independent from the facts being completely wrong. So, for example, when he said uh, there were uh, Muslims dancing on the rooftops or in the streets after 9-11, that, that does not fa- pass the fact checkers. But it is unambiguously true that his supporters and even his critics would say, I'm a little concerned that there are some people in the Muslim faith who are not as unhappy about 9-11 as they should have been. So in other words, what he said was technically, specifically, factually incorrect, as far as we can tell, you know, unless something new comes around. But it still fit. It fit what we were thinking. It fit the, the general truth that we all accept is probably true. And I would think you would accept that as well. And what you see in persuasion is something called pacing and leading. And it's a very important concept in persuasion. The pacing part is where you become compatible with the other person or persons you're trying to influence. You're trying to match them in some way that's important. And if you match them long enough, called pacing, uh, eventually they will let you lead because you are one of them. They're comfortable with you. They agree with you. They feel the same way you feel. They trust you. They trust you emotionally. And that's the way people need to trust you. Because trusting somebody factually is, is sort of a, a, a non-starter. It doesn't help that much, right? But trusting somebody emotionally says, yeah, I can let you do things that even I don't think are right, but I know that you're heading in the right direction. I trust that you have more information than I do. I trust that if you have to pivot because it doesn't work out, you'll do that. Because you and I are emotionally on the same page. We want generally the same thing. Similarly with um, take immigration. Now, one of the things that uh, President Trump and before that candidate Trump was saying that was emotionally compatible with a lot of people is, hey, there are, um, there's an immigration issue. It brings with it some amount of crime that we wish we didn't have. And it brings with it some risk of, uh, of terrorists slipping in, which we wish we didn't have. And those things scare us. And we would like to have less of it. Now, that's the, the emotional truth that is common to both sides of the conversation, right? That everybody would like less of those things. Now, the way he does it, of course, is with his typical hyperbole of coming in with the biggest first offer you've ever seen, which is, I'm going to ship back, you know, what was it, 12 million uh, people who are undocumented in this country. Now, now, when you heard it, and when people on the other side heard it, they quite reasonably said, holy hell, <laughs> there's no way you can do that, first of all. It would be cruel, second of all. Um, it would be, you know, it would cause riots in the streets. It would cause a civil war, practically. I mean, it's such a big, hard-to-do, you know, bad thing. But when I heard it, I said to myself, and I said publicly a lot of times, he doesn't mean that. He's, he's taken a big first offer that gives him lots of room to negotiate back. So now as we watch him as president, and what he's doing is, you know, I guess ICE is rounding up a lot of people who have committed crimes while in the country. You know, after coming into the country, they committed additional crimes. And probably there are some cases, I think almost surely, some cases where ICE, let's say, uh, breaks down a door and there's a room full of people and, you know, three of them have been in a, you know, serious gang violence situations. So of course you want to deport those guys. But then there's a couple of guys who are just members of the gang who, you know, you don't have any proof they did anything that was another additional crime. But what are they doing in the room? So let's say those two guys get shipped back too, because they're just sort of in that gray area and they're, they're so deeply into the gray, they're, you know, dark gray. Well, you don't have any proof. Now, when people see that story, and I'm sure that kind of story is going to be, you know, trickling out in different ways. And, and people compare that, they contrast it to what they imagined could have happened, which is, you know, 12 million people rounded up and shipped home. And they say to themselves, well, I wish we wouldn't deport people who we haven't seen for sure committed additional crime, but that's not so bad 
compared to what I thought was going to happen. So you see that process in a number of ways. You saw that when he he talked about fighting ISIS, he said we're gonna we're gonna go back to waterboarding and maybe we'll uh, kill the families of the of the terrorists. And a lot of people said, no, oh my God, you can't do that. That's going too far. There are lots of plenty of good practical reasons why you don't do those things. That he became president. And what did he do? He got pretty tough on ISIS. And I would argue that uh, civilian casualties probably have gone up because of that extra toughness. But we're not, you know, we're not, um, we're not seeing the big outcry because he's been successful, apparently, against ISIS on the battlefield. So we see this pattern, which he has broadcasted for decades. He actually wrote a book on it, The Art of the Deal, in which he talks explicitly about using hyperbole, you know, in other words, things that don't pass the fact-checking, and making big first offers to give him lots of room to negotiate toward the middle. So the, the thing that his supporters believe that his critics do not is that he is emotionally and intellectually on their side, and that he will work out the details when he needs to. So that's what his supporters believe. And I think we've seen a pretty unbroken pattern of exactly that happening. And I predicted this pattern you know, long before he even got nominated, because he has that skill set. He repeated that pattern often. And it was the only rational thing that I could see, unless he was you know, unless you imagined he was actually literally insane, um, it was the only thing I could imagine would happen. And sure enough, it's happening, you know, just as I predicted. Okay, well, there's a lot in there that strikes me as fairly strange ethically. For instance, this idea that he's making this first offer that is extreme, that then he walks back to something more reasonable and that this is a technique for which he pays no penalty. It's just an unambiguously good w technique that his fans recognize. Uh, let, let, me, let me interrupt you. I would never say he doesn't pay a penalty. The, this is a technique which absolutely, by its design, has a penalty. So in other words, he's saying, this is going to cost me because the fact checkers are going to be over me and blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to do it anyway. I guess I'm emphasizing something else here. It's not so much the the lying part or the failing the the reality testing part. It's more like if I'm going to say to you, you know what I think we should do. I mean, just let's just say this on the podcast. You know, I think we should round up those 12 million people and deport them. If I commit to that position, that's my position. Well, when you unpack that position, that commits me to things which I really must have thought about, or at least am pretending to have thought about, which are fairly unethical. I mean, it gets much worse than what you described. It's not just the fellow gang member or the, you know, very close to being a gang member who gets deported along with the convicted killer. It's the the mom of, a, you know, an eight-year-old kid who is an American citizen, right? You know, so you have the, these just families broken apart. And so if I'm going to pretend to be so callous as to happily absorb those facts. Like, yeah, send them all back. You know, they don't belong here in the first place. Or if I'm going to take the ISIS case, I'm going to say, yeah, we'll, we'll torture their kids. We'll kill their kids. doesn't matter. Whatever works, right? If that's my opening negotiation, I am advertising a level of callousness and a level of unconcern for the reality of human suffering all around me that will follow upon my actions that I mean, should I get what I ostensibly want? It's like a, in, in these two cases, a nearly psychopathic ethics that I'm advertising as my strong suit, right? So how this becomes attractive to people. Its face. I mean, you don't have to think deeply about this, right? These are these are the things that get pointed out in thirty seconds when he whenever he opens his mouth on a topic like this. I don't understand how that works for him with anyone. Let me let me, uh, let me give you a little thought experiment here. Uh, we've got people who are on the far right. We've got people on the left. In your perfect world, would it be better to move the people who are on the far right toward the middle, 
or the people on the far left toward the middle? Which which would be a preferred world for you? Oh, I don't know. Now now things have gotten so crazy on the left that 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 is actually a genuinely hard question to answer. But I, I think you know moving everyone toward the middle uh, certainly on most points would be a, a very good thing. So um, what you've observed with President Trump through his pacing and emotional compatibility with his base is that prior to, to uh, Inauguration Day, there were a lot of people in this country who were saying, yeah, yeah, round them all up, send all 12 million back tomorrow. When was the last time you heard anybody on the right complaining about that? Because what happened was immigration went down 50 to 70 percent or whatever the number is, just based on the fact that we would get tough on immigration. And the right says, oh, okay, we're, you know, we didn't get nearly what we asked for, but our leader, who we trust, who we love, has backed off of that. And we're going to kind of go with that because he's doing some good things that we like and we don't like the alternative either. So this, this monster that we elected, this, this, this Hitler dictator crazy guy, he managed to be the only person who could have, and I would argue always intended, to move the far right toward the middle. You, you saw it right, in, you know, we can observe it um, with our own eyes. We don't see the right saying, no, no, I, I hate President Trump. He's got to round up those undocumented people, like you said early in the campaign, or else I, I'm bailing on him. None of that happened. He paced them, and then he, leaded, he led them toward a reasonable uh, situation, which I would say we're in. Well, I, I don't know that I would notice if they were complaining about it. I, I got to think I'm in kind of an echo chamber, but you you might notice it more than I would. I promise you I would notice it because I'm totally, you know, I've got one foot in both sides. And, and the number of people who are talking about that, even just talking about rounding up everybody and sending it back, just stopped. It's completely done. And by the way, that that's a big deal. I mean, he he brought a lot of people to his position. Again, w- whether that was his intent or, in fact, the effect of his actions, I don't know. I mean, there's so much other chaos for people to be complaining about and and worrying about. But I I, I take a related point here, which which you could be making, which is that there is something else going on. There is there is the fact that people will follow him onto terrain that is quite different from the terrain they claim to want to occupy. And so they, they, will, they will kind of run roughshod over their own stated principles. And I'm noticing this with, with you know, establishment Republicans who, once they grabbed his coattails, it seems like they will, are willing to follow him anywhere, even into something that looks like almost treasonous level of fandom of, of Vladimir Putin. And so we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But I, I want to, before we continue down this line, I want you to describe this analogy that you've made, which I think is very useful. You have this two different movies analogy. And I just want to put that in play for listeners, because I think it's it's a good framing. Yeah, there are two concepts that people need to understand to have any idea what has happened in the past two years. One is confirmation bias. I'm sure you've talked about this a number of times on your podcast and in your books, which is the tendency for humans to see all evidence as supporting their side, even if it doesn't. All right, we're, we're we're all in confirmation bias pretty much all the time. Nobody's immune from it. Nobody's smart enough to see past it. It's just the human condition. The other part that people have to understand is this thing called cognitive dissonance, which I'm sure you've also talked about. And that's the, the idea that if, um, if our mind is set toward a, a specific reality, especially if it involves ourselves, you know, some self-image, and then we find ourselves doing something or learning something that violates what we're sure had to be true. We just reinterpret what we saw and, and spontaneously create essentially an illusion, uh, an imaginary world that explains all the things that wouldn't have been explained without that uh, hallucination. So what happened was um, on November 8th, 2016, there were a handful of people, including me, who saw things going just the way they imagined they would go. Now, that creates no trigger for cognitive dissonance because everything was consistent. I thought I was pretty smart. I thought I could predict what was going to happen. I did predict what was going to happen. But for a lot of the country, they, they thought this was an impossible outcome. 
They had been in their echo chambers and they saw there was just no way this could happen. The pe- the, there are people who have never even met a Trump supporter, much less imagined he could be, be elected. They looked at the polls. They saw it was 90, 98% likely that Hillary Clinton would win. And then the results didn't go that way. That's a perfect trigger for cognitive dissonance. And I described that uh, election as a cognitive dissonance cluster bomb. And what it did was it split the, uh, the United States and to some extent the rest of the world into what I call two movies that are running simultaneously on one screen. So if you imagine we're all in the audience, but half of the audience is looking at the same screen that, that you and I are, and half of them are seeing one movie, and the other half are watching an entirely different movie. In one of the movies, uh, we had just elected Hitler or something like it, and people were taking to the streets to say, oh my God, you know, the, the world is going to be on fire. And another half of the country were saying, hey, we got a guy who's probably going to be pretty good on jobs and you know, maybe he'll tighten up the borders and you know, do some um, business-like systems in government that we like. And that's all they saw. And the other side saw something completely different, an entirely different movie. Now, I had predicted uh, prior to the inauguration that because of that setup, which I could see coming from a mile away, that we would experience um, the following arc. We would, there, first of all, there would be huge protests because people thought that some Hitler character had been elected. But after a few months of President Trump acting like a normal president who is using the normal mechanisms of power and uh, is getting some stuff done and moderating his positions as presidents do, that the Hitler illusion would start to dissipate and that it would eventually give way by summer. That was my prediction. And it has largely. You know, the, the Hitler stuff has largely dissipated for lack of confirming evidence. And it was replaced with, well, he's not Hitler, but he's definitely incompetent. He's so incompetent. There's chaos in the White House. They can't get anything done. And I predicted that by the end of the summer, he would, in fact, get things done. But, but the criticisms uh, don't stop because that's just not the way it works. People don't change positions like that. They simply change the reasons that they oppose them. And I predicted that the reasons would change from, you know, he's Hitler to he's incompetent to, all right, he did get a lot of things done and they were the things he said he was going to get done and they, they do match, you know, Republican positions, but we don't like it, all right? He is competent, he does get things done, he's effective, but we don't like what he's doing. So I think that's where, you, where it's going to be by year end. And it seems to be heading that way. One thing I, I want to point out, which just strikes me as a strange emphasis that I've heard from you here, but I've, I've also heard this just quite frequently from other Trump supporters. So it, it, I just want to flag it. I don't know what if much turns on it. But so, for instance, in your description of what created the cognitive dissonance, you talk about the failure of people who don't like Trump to predict that he would win the election. So that everyone was just blindsided by the fact that he won. And this put them into this, the other movie theater, uh, where they're seeing just you know, civilization unravel. I mean, for me, it was never a matter of being sure that Hillary Clinton was going to win. In fact, the last poll I looked at that I thought was actually informative, you know, Trump had a 20 or 25 percent chance of winning. And I, you know, I, I'm statistically educated. I know how often a 20 percent chance of winning comes up. It's not a tiny probability. So it's not the surprise that is worth emphasizing here. It's the horror at the fact that we have elected someone so obviously wrong for the job. This two movies analysis still works. Whether you predicted anything or whether anyone else predicted anything, even if everyone thought it was a, it was a horse race until the last second and there was a 50% chance of, of either candidate winning, I think you would have the exact same outcome in terms of a repudiation of this of this choice that our, our nation made. But Sam, let me ask you this. At what point in the process did you decide that he was incompetent to be president? That is a great question. That is, I, I love that question. That That is my favorite question ever asked of me on this podcast. I guess let's focus on the master persuader idea because I mean, this here's the movie I'm in, right? Uh, you, you You've said that Trump is the greatest persuader you've ever seen. I, I think you actually wrote, uh, I think I, I saw this in a blog post of yours, that 
you wrote that if Steve Jobs was a 10, Trump is a 15. I think I have that right. Okay, so here's the movie I'm in. And this predates this election by at least a decade. I find Trump one of the least persuasive people on earth. I mean, long before he ran for president, he struck me as nothing more than an odious con man. He strikes me as an absolutely despicable person. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I, can I get a clarification? When yeah. you said he was an odious con man, did you mean that he was good at being a conning people or bad at conning people? Well, he was cl clearly conning some people. I'm saying that he's not conning me. And so the, 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 the question well, is that the, the mismatch. Let me, can, can I interrupt you again? Because yeah, yeah, this sure. is really important. Um, he was conning, apparently, according to your frame of things in, you know, prior to the election. It seems probably to you that he was conning enough people to do the things he needed to do which was, you know, build buildings and keep his fortune high and become a reality TV star and, and all that stuff. Yeah, but but that was it. He was a reality TV star who, I mean, I, I, I viewed him, actually, I viewed him, I, mean, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about him, but I, I assumed that most people were in on the joke, right? That he was a kind of punchline. It, it was like a, a punchline lived over the course of a profitable life. But he was. This was not somebody who was, as he was billing himself to be, a truly great businessman or anything else. Yeah, Sam. There's an important point here that I, I don't want to lose by going sure. too far past it. Uh, your your understanding of him at the time was that he could con some people, and apparently it was enough of the right people he was conning, to use your word, to effectively do the things he was trying to do. Would that would that accurately state your opinion? Well, yeah, but the things he was trying to do bore no relationship to becoming president or becoming somebody who's actually well, right, right. shouldering significant responsibility. No, I agree with that. But we're just talking about the tools of persuasion. And, and what you just said, if, if I heard it right, is that even early on, you realized he had the tools of persuasion, which you would characterize as a con man. Uh, just a different word for essentially the same set of tools. It has more to do with the intention, I guess. But the crucial difference here, again, I'm, I'm just trying to describe what it's like to watch my movie as opposed to your movie or the movie watched by half the country. I, I can see that he must be persuading somebody. I mean, he fully persuaded half the country to become president. But there is never a moment where I find him persuasive. When I look at him, I see a man... I mean, it's it's really uncanny. It's it's like a it's. I see a man without any inner life. I see I see the most superficial person on earth. Is like it's a guy who's been totally hollowed out by greed and self regard and just delusion. I mean, the the way he yeah. talks about himself is so. It's like I mean, if if I caught some sort of brain virus, and I started talking about myself, the way Trump talks about himself. I would throw myself out a fucking window. I mean, I, it's like, like that, that barely overstates it. It's like, I mean, do you remember that scene in the, yeah. the end of The Exorcist where the priest finally, he's, he's driving out the devil from Linda Blair and the devil comes into him and then he just hurls himself out the window to end all the madness? Well, it would be like that, right? Uh, yeah. Or, um, yeah, we've gone full exorcist on this. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the things that I write about and, and Periscope about is the triggers, you know, or the tells for cognitive di dissonance, you know. H how do you tell that you're in it versus somebody else is in it? Did I just give you one of my tells? Yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> the, the, most the most classic one is to imagine that you can know somebody's inner mental processes. So if you imagine that in his mind he's thinking this, or in his mind he's hollowed out, or in his mind there's no depth, uh, if you imagine that those are in there, I would say that is entirely imaginary and almost certainly a tell for well, cognitive Well, distance. no, it, it, but and it's by not. By the way, hold that. Hold yeah, on, yeah. Let me finish the thought. Sure. And the, and the trigger. So what I look for for confirmation is there's got to be a trigger and then the second thing, which is the tell. So I just described the tell, which is describing some of these inner thoughts that you couldn't possibly know. And I mean, nobody could. Uh, and the trigger you also described very clearly. The trigger was there's something about his manner, the way he speaks, that bugs the fuck out of you, and, and that's your trigger. You're just misinterpreting a couple of things here. It's not, it's not the way he speaks, and it's not that I'm engaged in a mind-reading exercise. 
it's based entirely on what he says. It's the, it is actually the thoughts that come out of his mouth. It's not how he says it. It's what he says. But wait, you said two things that are in contradiction now. You said that he's a con man and always has been, but that the things he said are a good reflection of what he's thinking. You kind of have to pick one. Well, no, it's just that he is a, a liar who will lie whenever it suits his interest and even when it doesn't suit his interest. He, he will lie with, a, with a, an, an alacrity that I have never seen before in a public person. I think, yeah, I think there are, you have to break that into two categories, the, the things you're calling the lies, maybe three. There, there are some things which probably he thinks are right and he just gets wrong, which would be typical of any... I'll forgive him many of those things, yes. Right. There are some things which are clearly just hyperbole, which he knows are not exactly factual, but it works better to you know, make the big first offer. And then there's another category, which is the hardest for anybody to understand. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure I'll be able to sell this to anybody here. But if you are uh, a trained persuader, you have such a low regard for some types of facts that you just don't care if they're right or wrong because they really aren't ever going to matter to the outcome. They won't matter to decisions and they won't matter to the outcome. Now, I believe, uh, having been watching him through this filter now for a couple of years, that he can definitely tell the difference between all those categories and that uh, I haven't seen him tell the lie that, that causes... Uh, you know, the country to be harmed in any way. They, they all seem to be either trivial and he just doesn't care. And, you know, there's no point in apologizing because that's bad persuasion too, in many cases. Uh, or, or they're emotionally correct. So there, my filter on this, that he's actually a skilled persuader and he knows exactly what he's doing. And those things which are clearly just mistakes tend to be trivial. Uh, that is what I used to predict the outcome that got us exactly where we are. And my starting point was everybody can, can hindcast. Everybody can say, oh, the way he won was, here's my reason. CNN listed, I think, I don't know, 24 different reasons why the surprising result of, of his election happened. Uh, and they're all different reasons. So as you know, confirmation bias, blah, blah, blah allows you to explain what happened in the past with any number of stories and they all fit. That's why we have you know, trials and lawyers and all of their stories sound good and the jury has to sort it out. But what I did early on is I said, I'm so sure that these tools are real and consistent and he knows what he's doing that I'm gonna risk my entire fucking career to predict that he's gonna win it all and win it big. And not only did he win it big, but you know, he won in the, the electoral uh, college. He won the only way that it mattered. He played the only game that they were playing, and he won. Now, some people will say, well, he lost the popular vote. And I would say, you're right. He did lose the game that he wasn't playing. He never played that game. So uh, if you look at the predictions, and if you see that they seem to be hitting all the, the right notes, that is a little more persuasive than saying, well, I'm going to look at it in the past and apply these you know, 25 different filters that all pretty much work. There are lots of different explanations of how things work in the past. But Scott, the emphasis on him successfully persuading doesn't deal with the fact that what he would be persuading someone toward or the country toward may not be a good thing. I mean, so for instance, I think he is someone who is so morbidly selfish. And again, this is not me with a crystal ball. This is me just looking at how he's lived his life, the kinds of things he's done, the kinds of things he says about himself. He's put himself first to such a pathological degree that I think he's capable of committing treason or something like treason without even noticing it. There's, there's no sense at all that he has the public good in mind when he's acting. So the fact that he's a good persuader, even if I were going to grant you that, and there's, other, there's one thing I want to flag here that you just said that I, I think is, is manifestly not true, which is that none of his lies have harmed our society. I think all of his lies have harmed our society. I think the fact that we have a president who lies and everyone knows it and, 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 and no one can really trust what he has said until the facts come out, I think that has done immense harm to the world, frankly. In, in, what, in what quantitative way is it? 
would the stock would the stock market be at even higher record levels? The stock market would, is would, the is would, the wrong metric here. I mean, it, well, would 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 ISIS be reconstituting if he if he'd been a little more forthcoming? Would would North Korea have you know not have launched that last nuke? What what exactly would be the evidence that something he said has actually harmed the fabric of society? The fact okay. that all of us are talking about politics, the fact that politics is so much a part of our lives now is toxic. It's a sign that something is wrong with our society. If things were good, we would not be talking about politics, right? I mean, uh, we're, okay. we're, we're, ta we're talking about politics right. 10 times more than we ever have in the lifetime of any person hearing this podcast. I could list a hundred other bad things, but that's one symptom. It's a, it's a very good thing, and I'll tell you why. So first of all, the, going back to the two movies on one screen, the, the, the people on the right, the people who are supporting Trump, are having the best two years of their lives. I mean, I have never seen such joy and happiness coming out of that segment of the public. But again, that's, a, that's an amoral claim. I mean, you know that that, that would have been said of, to take the extreme example, the burgeoning enthusiasm for the thousand year Reich in, in you know, 1938. I mean, it's just like the, the, you get nothing with that claim. Did, did you go full Hitler analogy? I went full Hitler analogy conscious of, of how it would be received. Can I, can I declare victory at this point? No, no. I, I think that's actually a, a bad meme. Was it, is that Godwin's Law? I think it's a bad meme that we, we have to quash somehow. I, I, I've actually been writing, uh, I write this in my new book, that when somebody retreats to analogy, whether it's a Hitler analogy or not, it's because they've run out of reasons. Like no, nobody uses an analogy if they have a reason, because a reason is all wait. Is way better than analogy. No, no, no. Well, okay. Well, that, that that's interesting. I, I think I disagree with that too. But well, let's move on. Analogies are tools of communication. If you're not getting what I'm saying, but I know you'll get this other test case that I think is actually isomorphic with with what I'm talking about. Well, then I go to the analogy. It's only bad if it's a bad analogy. But nothing nothing hinges on this. No, because all analogies are approximations by design. So you're not talking about the same topic. You know. Uh, anyway. We could talk about analogies some more. Sure. Uh, I, I agree that analogies are excellent for explaining a concept for the first time. So if you say a zebra, if you've never heard of a zebra, it's like a horse, but imagine it has some stripes on it. So I don't, I, you know, there, there are lots yeah, of that, cases where that, that's that, good. that gets me a long way to a zebra. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't make a zebra a horse, right? And never can, right? So that's my only point. So back to the uh, whether it's bad that we're all talking about politics. I've actually been streaming and talking and blogging about this very point, that we have collectively as a society learned more about each other, the nature of you know, truth, reality, persuasion in particular. You'll see lots of people talking now about cognitive dissonance, confirmation bias, persuasion. These are important concepts for people's happiness and understanding of their, of their condition that we never had before. And in fact, before the election, I had said uh, several times and publicly that what Trump was going to do was not just change politics, which he did. I mean, he changed everything, but that he would rip a hole in the fabric of reality and let us peek through. And that hole is, is what we're peeking through right now, which is that, two, that people can sit in the same theater watching a different movie and that there's a reason for it. We know what the reason is. It's confirmation bias. It's cognitive dissonance. And that, uh, it, and that that's, you know, that understanding goes a lot further than, hey, your facts are wrong. You lied about this. You didn't pass my fact checking. You know, if you're, if you're locked in that smaller, less aware world where you think that people make decisions on logic and facts because you think they should, you're, you're missing the biggest part of life, which is that people don't. Yeah, I would agree with you if you said to me, Scott, I think we should use reason and facts, and we should never depart from that. I would say, sure, that's great. We should, but we can't because we're not built that way. We humans don't have that capacity in general. Yeah, we can in very const constrained ways like science, but in general, no. Okay, well, let's plant a flag there because that's an interesting topic that is obviously bigger and deeper than this political topic, and maybe we'll get to it. And that's actually the topic in some measure of your first book or your last book that I've been reading. Um, and if we have time, I'd love to touch that. But I just want to come back. I mean, again, I, I'm, I have this creeping feeling of confusion or bewilderment that I, I want you to sort out for me. And it comes down to this two movie analogy, because I don't see how they are actually different movies. I get that 
in the other theater, the fans of Trump don't care about certain things that are appearing on the screen. And I care very strongly about those things, but I don't get how they're actually not seeing these things or they're seeing them differently. And I want to take you back just to what you said before when, when I went full exorcist on you. Well, can I, can I, can I interrupt? Because I think sure. there have been some news reports recently that said that Trump, Trump supporters know exactly you know, what's true and what isn't. Uh, and there isn't that much difference between the two sides. I'll give you an example of like, this is what the kind of thing that's in my movie. There's literally a hundred things I can mention here, but I'll just mention a couple. So it just, it seems to me that everything you need to know about Trump's ethics were revealed in the whole Trump university scandal, right? So I mean, this is a guy who's having his employees pressure poor elderly people to max out their credit cards in exchange for fake knowledge. And as unseemly... Well, hold on. You, now, you understood that to be a license deal, right? Well, yeah, but I, I understand that to be the kind of thing that he would have to know enough about to know what he was doing. He, if he only found out about it after the fact, it's not the kind of thing you would defend. It's the kind of thing you would be mortified about and you would apologize for and you would pay reparations for if you're this rich guy who has all the money you claim to have. I mean, it's like... Unless, unless you were a master persuader who knew that if you ever back down from anything, people would expect you to back down in the future from other things. But what you're describing is a totally unethical person, right? I mean, this is the problem for me. So let me just give you a little more, a couple more points here. But I would say to you that there are false equivalencies around this kind of thing. So that I mean, people will say that all politicians are liars or all politicians have something weird in their backstory, but there are very few politicians walking around with something that ugly in their backstory that they haven't re repaired. And let me let me just clarify, though, when I said it was a license deal as opposed to a a business that he was actively running um, in the Dilbert world, I do a lot of license deals uh, and have in the past. And the nature of those is that you're sort of giving your brand and your name, and then you're not really paying attention to the actual management of the company. For 100% of Trump supporters, if that was the case. Now, if it was a typical license deal, where you don't really know exactly what people are doing and you're not paying attention because you got, uh, in his, his case, I think 400 companies with his name on them. Well, yeah, his whole life is a license deal for the most part. Even his real estate empire is a license deal. Yeah. So if it were the case that he was treating it like every other license deal, there's a, a high likelihood, far more likely than not, that he didn't know about the details until it was too late. Now, once he found out the details, how he handled it in court or whatever is, is, is yet another separate case. But it's a separate case that, that even granting you that, it's a separate case that says everything about the man's ethics. But I'll, I'll give you two more examples. No, wait, wait. But it, it's, it says everything about his ethics if he was aware of it at the time. Oh, no, no. If you're aware of it in the aftermath. I mean, if I created some deal, if I created, you know, you know Sam Harris, you know, Waking Up Podcast University. And I licensed it out. I mean, first of all, the fact that he, that you would license his, license it out to other con men, right, who are unscrupulous and not do proper vetting there, but claim you had. I mean, he, there's a whole commercial with him talking about how these are the geniuses that, that will be instructing you in this incredibly expensive but profitable uh, enterprise. If you did all that, you're already a schmuck, right? But imagine I had done that, but I'm so busy. I've got 400 different businesses and I just didn't really understand. I got lured. I got conned, say, and, and I, I got lured into doing this with people I didn't totally vet. In the aftermath, I would be horrified if I found out that someone, you know, had, had their life savings ripped from them by con men who I had licensed, right? And I'm this billionaire I would atone for that as much as could possibly be done. I mean, that's just like you have to do that. Now, Sam, in, when you say you would atone for it, let's talk about the financial part of that atoning. Yeah. Would you, would you then negotiate with the people who are complaining to figure out, you know, what was an appropriate payment? Would you do that? It would be obviously indefensible, and I would immediately pay 
back everything that was lost and probably more because because of like there's just all the pain and suffering associated with it. You have you have to make people whole. But but would you give them whatever they asked for? Just like hey, give me 10 million dollars, okay. Well, well no, that there has to be some, you know, rational consideration of what the the actual cost is. But again, you know the spirit in which he defended this, right? He hasn't admitted that this was a sham. It's of a piece with everything else that he's represented about himself. He's a genius who's done nothing but help the world, and the world is so ungrateful they can't recognize it, and, and all the rest is fake news. I mean, it's just he's— But let me, but let me ask you just again, uh, and by the way, just I want to be very clear that there's nothing about Trump University that I defend. But that should mean something to you. I mean, but, that, Hold on, hold on. But, but I also think it needs to be put in, into his clearest context. And the clearest context is there were people who used the legal system for their complaints, and Trump used the legal system the way it is used to negotiate. And part of that negotiation is, hey, I'm taking you to court. Well, you know, go ahead, I'll take you to court. So that's how you negotiate in the legal context. Okay, but that, when it was done, when it was done, he paid them back <laughs> as the legal the legal process, you know, probably was going to come out that way no matter whether he got elected president or not. It shouldn't have had to have gone to court. The fact that it had to go to court is a sign of his litigiousness, his defensiveness, his not owning the problem, and who knows how many other scandals like this are in his past where the people couldn't afford to go to court, right? So that, I mean, we actually know a lot about the way he, he built buildings insofar as he actually built them. And he screwed hundreds, if not thousands of people. And these are people who couldn't afford to take him to court. This guy's reputation is so well known. Have, have you ever been involved in a uh, big construction project? Because I've done a few. And what, and what do you do when a subcontractor doesn't perform the way you want them to perform? That's one description of what has happened. But again, you're, you're ignoring the fact that he has a unique reputation for screwing people. And this is something that journalism didn't do its job before the election to get this out. Well, but, but yeah, I would agree he has a reputation. But what is the source of that reputation? It's the people who didn't get paid, right? But, but again, the fact that Trump University exists and, and then the fact that he handled it the way he did tells me did, did, everything did, I need to know about him. Everything, did, literally, literally everything, did, Scott. Did, did, did you just change the subject? No, from, no, I, I'm just so. saying that I can, see, I can see his real estate career through the lens of Trump University. If you give me Trump University, I can tell you what kind of developer he's going to be and how he's going to treat his subs. Well, that's, that's, another, that's another analogy problem, that Trump University is an analogy. To no, it's, no, it's because people's ethics tend to cohere. If you think you can screw someone mercilessly when they're under your power in one context, you are the kind of person, I, I, I will predict, will be screwing people who are under your power in other contexts, unless you've got some kind of multiple personality disorder. Are, are there no stories which you're aware of in which President Trump has done things which he was not required to do, which were considered a kindness? Well, let me tell so I'll give you two other points which I think aren't entangled with these, these wrinkles, and which kind of make the same point to remind people wh why we're here. I'm talking about what it's like for me to see my movie and how I don't understand people who are watching the other movie find a charitable way to see these things as they hit the screen. So the other example I would give you is two, and these are, these are so disparate, but I each say a lot about the man. They're each something which, if you and I did them, that's more or less game over, right? So, so you take his career as a beauty pageant host and owner, and the stories well attested, endlessly well attested at this point, of him being the, the creep who keeps barging into the dressing room so he can look at the beauty pageant contestants, right? These 18-year-old girls who are essentially his employees so that he can catch them naked. So there's that moment, right? Doing that over and over again. And then at his career as a, as a pseudo-philanthropist, I mean, so there's like this, here's a great example. There's this, this ribbon-cutting ceremony for a children's school that was serving kids with, with AIDS. This is back in the 90s. And he, pretending to be one of the big donors, and just to get a photo op with the mayor of New York, and I think the former mayor of New York, and, and the real donors to this charity, he jumps on stage, pretending that he belongs there at the ribbon cutting. He never gave a dime to this charity. No one knew he was coming. He literally crashed the party to pretend that he was this big-time philanthropist. Now, you might say, well, this is brilliant PR, right? 
it's completely immoral PR. It tell, like, like if, if I had done this, right, you wouldn't be on this podcast. If you found out these things about me, listen, Sam Harris pretends that he gives to charity when he doesn't. And he barges into the dressing rooms of, of, of his teenage employees so that he can catch them naked. And he's got this thing called Harris University that, that you know, he had to get sued in order to apologize for. In fact, he never apologized for. Those three things about me, you wouldn't be on this podcast, and for good reason. But yet you're saying you would elect me president of the United States. Yeah, I, I would go even further and say that if you actually knew the, the secret life of any of our politicians, we would, we would impeach all of them. So the, the problem is that it's, just, it's, it's not true. The, the people tend to be fairly despicable when you, when you drill down. Do you, re, you really think you really think Obama is trailing things of, of this magnitude, character flaws, uh, manifest character flaws of this magnitude? Uh, well, I won't name names, but uh, I would say that the, it would be more common than not common for the, for, uh, you know, especially the males to have like sketchy, sketchy behavior with the opposite sex. Not this level of sketchy behavior. I mean, this is, again, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the Billy Bush groping tape, which I think is keep, keep appropriate to. You, yeah. Keep in mind that President Trump's uh, past is far more public than other people's. So you're going to see the, you know, the warts as well as the good stuff. Uh, but, but let me, let me uh, stop acting like I'm disagreeing with uh, the general claim you're making that he has done things that you and I might not do in the same situation and would disapprove of. I'm going to say that that is common and, and would be shared by Trump supporters as well. But then you seem to give it no ethical weight. Here's the proposition. He came in and he said in these very words, uh, I'm no angel, uh, but I'm going to do these things for you. Now, he created a situation where for his self-interest, if you imagine he's the most selfish, narcissistic, egotistical human who ever lived, he only cares about himself. He put himself in a position where there was exactly one way for any of those things to go right for him, which is to do a really, really freaking good job. and. To imagine that he wants to do anything but the best job for the country now, now that he's in the position, and it's you know, probably also when he was running, is, is beyond ludicrous. And I would say- Okay, stop there, because there's, I, I, will, I will grant you that he cares about his reputation to some degree, and his reputation would be enhanced if at the end of four years, or at the end of eight years, more likely, he was- described as the greatest president we ever had. I mean, I think he would like that. If you could give him a, you know, a magic wand and he could wave it in any direction, he would want to leave being spoken of as the next Lincoln or the next Jefferson. And so, so granted, that in, in, in that sense, his interests and the country's interests would be aligned. But there are two problems with, with that idea. One is there are many ways in which his interests, his personal selfish interests and that of his family are not aligned with those of the country. And there's real harm to our institutional norms on that basis. I mean, so we have this family functioning like the, the ruling family in a banana republic now. I mean, they're, they're enriching themselves at every turn. There's endless reports of, you know, the State Department and the Secret Service paying tens of thousands of dollars to stay in Trump hotels. You've got Ivanka hawking her gold bracelet that she was wearing on the first 60 Minutes interview, you know, 48 hours after the election. You got the incessant pumping of Trump-branded properties with taxpayer dollars. I mean, there's, just, there's no end to this, right? And they're doing deals in dozens of countries. And they, so there's no, there are conflicts of interest that they won't even acknowledge. Well, we'll get to Russia. There's this Russia thing, which is clearly not in the interest of the U.S. and may very well be in Trump's interest to, uh, I would say, court a Again, I mean, I, I think the word treason, I'm not using the word treason in, in, a, in the technical sense, like I think he'll be convicted of treason, but there's a treasonous level of disregard for the interests of our country in how he has been dealing with Russia thus far and the Russia scandal. Or, or he's just being persuasive and, and practical. Both of those filters fit. There's nothing persuasive about being the first president who will openly without any i mean without any caveat just praise and align himself with a dictator of putin's quality who has just maliciously targeted our country in a way that is totally unambiguous first of all uh, i'm sure that we 
target other countries so that, you know, the context is we're probably all doing it to everybody else. Again, this is a move into a kind of amoral equivalence, which doesn't make any sense to me because, of course, we seek to influence other countries, but we do it because we actually have our values, right? I mean, like we, we think our values are good. If we're trying to influence an election in Iran, say, the reason why we think that is legitimate is because we are the good guys there. Now, and I mean that in a fairly deep sense, right? I mean, we are fighting for democratic values and tolerance of minorities and, you know... I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree with all that. I'm just saying that in the, in the real world, in the real world, if a country pokes you, you poke them back the same way. That's just going to happen. Okay, but we have, a, we have a president now who says nothing but good things about a dictator who we know jails and kills his political opponents and jails and kills journalists. Let me... Let me, let, me, let me refer you to, there were some CIA analysts recently who said, uh, retired ones, I guess, who said that they were worried that Trump could be easily manipulated by his ego through flattery and that foreign leaders are looking at his tweets and his personality and say, hey, we can totally persuade this guy to do what we want by using this flattery thing. Now we're watching President Trump flatter the not only the North Korean dictator by, by calling him a smart cookie for staying in power, but also Putin and also the Chinese leadership. You've seen him uh, flatter the three leaders that we most want to persuade. But I've seen him play both sides. I mean, that in one tweet, he'll bash the Chinese leadership, and he was bashing the Chinese leadership throughout the campaign, and he'll bash Kim Jong-un in another tweet. He's both sides of it. He's, he's, it's, not, it's not one thing or the other. It's the chaos of his own personality and his problems with impulse control made manifest. Is it as he bashed them since he was president? Because there are things he did on the campaign trail. Which, which, which case are you talking about? Well, just tweets about how obviously we can't count on China anymore and warning Kim Jong-un that there's going to be a massive penalty to be paid for. Okay, those, let, let me explain both of those things. Warning Kim Jong-un that there's going to be a massive penalty is not saying something about the individual, all right? It's just saying the, the same thing that any president would say in that situation. The situation with China, which I wrote about extensively, is that the, the smartest persuasion that he could do in that situation is to set China up as the adult in their neighborhood who for some reason can't control their own backyard. So that's, that's the setup he gave them. He said, you guys are great. You know, why don't you take care of this North Korea stuff? We'll, we'll take a step back, you know, get this done. Then when it didn't get done, he didn't say, you guys are assholes, because that would have been a big mistake. He said, well, we tried. You know, China's great. They didn't get it done. Uh, you know, maybe next time. That is exactly the right persuasion and exactly how I would have played it, because that gave him a free pass to do something that China doesn't want him to do if he needs to do that, because he said publicly, we trust you guys, we, you guys can take care of this. And then he waited, and in fact, they increased, uh, apparently they increased trade with North Korea. And so he's, he pointed it out factually, correctly, and said, well, I guess that didn't work. And that gives him a moral free pass because he just, he just gave them the, the opportunity to fix it themselves first. Well, I'm not claiming that was the wrong communication at that point. It's just that it all has the character of a haphazard ejaculation of whatever he's thinking or, or the product of the last conversation he had. So when he met with the China's leader, he, he said after 10 minutes, he was convinced that, you know, the trade thing is not what he thought it was, right? Meanwhile, he had campaigned on the trade thing being one way for months. And so there's, there's something about the fact that he pretends to have it all worked out until the next moment where he has to reverse course completely without ever acknowledging that he's reversed course, without ever giving an, an intelligent account of, of why it happened. And, and you're attributing this to some kind of real method to his madness. But in most cases, it just looks like madness or it just looks like a just a lack of understanding of what he was going to have to think anyway. Yeah, I, I think there are probably several things going on. One of them is a learning process. And the people who supported him and voted for him, uh, I think everybody had their eyes open that you plump a non-politician into this job, whether it's you know Barack Obama with a little bit of experience or or Trump. Um, 
that the, they're going to be learning and, and evolving fairly quickly on the job. So there's some of that, you know, genuine changing of opinion. There is some, the situation changes, so he, he pivots. But he also says clearly and often that he, uh, he likes being unpredictable and he likes setting his adversaries off balance. You know, are you my friend? Are you my enemy? Are you going to are you going to set a slap a tariff on me? Are we? Do we have a treaty? And persuasion-wise, that is brutally effective because it makes everybody search for, uh, you know, the the one thing they can depend on. And if he offers it, they're going to grab it. So keeping people off balance until you offer them your solution is actually pretty standard persuasion. I mean, he's persuaded something like half the country to vote for him. You know, as I've said, I've never found him persuasive even for a moment. And he's clearly not persuaded the other half of the country. And now his approval ratings or whatever they are, that you know, they're they're as low as things can get, given that there's a, a, a certainly a quorum of Republicans who will never disapprove of him, even as he said, if he shoots someone in Times Square. I, I get that he's president, right? He got elected. So he his persuasion or whatever it was got him that far. I think it says less about him, frankly, than about the state of the country the, 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 and, and our relationship to fame and reality television and an advertisement of wealth as opposed to, you know, the, the reality of being wealthy. I mean, so the fact that he the con worked, I'll grant you, means something. It doesn't mean something great about him. It means something that I perceive as 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 a symptom of a problem in our relationship to politics and our relationship to facts in this case. But don't you think we're... Uh... We are, or at least maybe we want to be or should be, past the point where the, uh, the president is the role model for our children, and he's more like the lawyer that you, that you hire because he's the best lawyer, even though he, the last job he did was to represent the mob or something. You know, don't you want the best lawyer, the best plumber? But it's so far beyond that. So I, I don't have any illusions about how good a person needs to be to be president. And or or and I don't have any illusions about how the the system as it's currently set up sort of selects against many of the people we would want. I mean, it's just so such a hassle to try to become president, and you have to slog through so much dirt to get there that it, it seems to be selecting for people who are a little bit more narcissistic than we would want, a little bit less principled than we would want, a little bit too eager to sell themselves to other interests that, that, than we would want, but still, he is a unique case of someone, again, based on everything that he advertised about himself before he ever mentioned that he wanted to be president. I mean, going back 20 years, he is a unique case of somebody who, to my eye, does not have the ethical core, the intellectual interest, the experience, not, I mean, really nothing that would suggest that he would be a good representative of this country or a model for our children, as you put it. Let, let me uh, describe what I call my perfect life arc. And that would be you're, you're born as a little baby and you're helpless and you're completely selfish because you have to be. It's the only way you can survive. Other people got to do it for you. As you're a kid, you maybe you help out with some chores, but you're still mostly selfish. By the time you're an adult, especially if you've had children, you end up giving more than you're taking. And if you've done everything right and you've taken care of yourself and your family and you're old and you're 71 years old, the last thing you should be doing is giving back more. And the very last thing you do on your, at the moment of your death is transfer 100% of your assets to other people. So the perfect life is perfectly selfish and, and trying to improve every year until you're perfectly giving. If you look at Trump's arc, you can see the perfectly selfish part uh, and and it was really part of his brand through his primary working years, through the Trump University years and all that. And we see, especially with a, a young son and a new wife, he's reached a certain point in his career, he's turned over his company. And in my opinion, and again, this would be making the mistake of, you know, imagining I can tell his inner thoughts, but I have I have talked to people who know him and, and have talked to him personally about this stuff. And the reports I get is that he's actually doing this for his son and for the country. And to your point, uh, he knew he's not he's not a neophyte to you know the public life. He knew that running for president as a Republican, especially, 
was going to get his reputation just destroyed. The, the amount of arrows this guy signed up to take is hard to explain in selfishness. You know, if you put the selfishness filter on that, then he's crazy too, because he did something that clearly would, you know, would be awfully painful for him and his family. They're, they're risking physical death. That's a naive or incomplete picture of what selfishness entails. I, I think, I mean, most people who are selfish, we're all selfish to some degree, and most of us manage to do many things that in retrospect seem unwise or needlessly incurring of hassle in the spirit of trying to get what we want out of life. But here, I, ha I think you have someone who is so malignantly selfish that, yeah, he will do things that seem completely crazy and counterproductive, even by that yardstick. Because like, like to take, for example, the Russia hacking of our election. I, I think we should talk about that because it is so important. And, and it's a place where I think Trump's interests as a candidate and as a president diverge radically from our nation's interests and the world's interests. But take what would have been a completely sane response to the Russian hacking by any other president. Even if it was clear that Russia's influence had helped him as it is and probably tipped the balance, among other things, that tipped the balance toward getting him elected. I mean, we're talking about, in some cases, 70,000 votes. So if anyone was influenced by Russian bots or the Podesta leaks, it was enough to put him over the line. Even if there was the fear, the understandable fear that this made his presidency seem illegitimate, you know, a sane, normal person would turn on a dime rather, rather than say, this is fake news, or it never happened, or I don't agree with 17 intelligence agencies, I'm going to take Vladimir Putin's word for the fact that he didn't do anything, right? Or maybe it was a 400-pound teenager in his mother's basement. You turn on a dime and you say, listen, we have to get to the bottom of this. It's completely unacceptable for a foreign power to hack into you know, my, my political rival's database and leak this information. And we're living in a world now where cyber espionage and cyber war, these are among the greatest threats to the smooth functioning of civilization. And we have to get to the bottom of this. And Russia has to pay a penalty for what they did. And I guarantee you, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Now, you take yourself out of the equation, but all he has done is defend himself in more and more preposterous ways, lying about everything until the facts come out. And the thing is, he's surrounded by surrogates who are forced to do this as well. Everyone is forced to compromise themselves trying to make sense of his latest lie or his latest tweet. Yeah, let me, let me put some context on that as well. So uh, I think you'd agree that um, the credibility of the presidency matters and that uh, a president, whether it was President Trump or any other president, who came into office and knew it wasn't really going to change. I mean, in all likelihood, he will serve on his term. I think you'd agree. Yeah, more likely than not, right? Well, at this point, I actually, I don't know if it's more likely than not at this point, but I, I would grant you as of a week ago, it was much more likely than not. <laughs> all right. So uh, under those conditions, the country is best served by feeling that their president is legitimate, right? So whether we like that or not, the fact is that we are best served by thinking that he's legitimate enough to do the job. Secondly, uh, he has a lot of uh, competing uh, things he has to balance. One is that you can't let Russia get away with this. And the second is, you can't piss them off when you need them as much as we need them right now. So those are two competing things. My assumption, and you, know, you can test this against your own assumption, is that we're not letting them off the hook and that we're going to fuck them as hard as we can well, we... through the CIA. And through the CIA, uh, and we're probably going to mess with their cyber. We have probably... The CIA that you just publicly said you don't trust to analyze the situation? Rather, you trust Putin, and then you send out a, a tweet which says we're going to form a joint cyber command with Putin to figure out how to deal with cyber. I mean, it's insane. It's not principled. It's not strategic. It's just a madman on Twitter. But let me ask you this. Do you think it is likely or unlikely that our intelligence agencies are uh, planning or have already uh, responded forcefully? Well, I certainly hope that's the case, but I'll tell you what is also likely or in fact certain. But if, but, if, but if you don't know, why do you think he's not doing his job? 
the very best way to play this, in my opinion, would be to publicly support Putin the way that Putin is you know, publicly saying they had nothing to do with the election. While under the hood, Putin probably did have much to do with the election. And Trump is probably fucking him as hard as he can under the hood. But he's fucking himself, too. Don't you understand? He's been fucking himself this whole time because he has so alienated our intelligence apparatus. We have career service intelligence people who are risking their careers and in some cases probably risking prison time leaking against him. So all of these leaks that are coming out of our intelligence services are illegal and they're being provoked by the fact that he has He's taken the wrong side in a geopolitical contest against a known adversary. Well, I, I just told you that in all likelihood, he's doing exactly what we want him to do. But we wouldn't know what's happening with the intelligence services, what's happening in cyber. We wouldn't know. But we know about the leaks against him. We know about how much chaos is being caused over this Russia investigation and how it's being dragged out and how everyone's lying about it. I mean, this is a disaster. So we've been watching for two years as the uh, so-called mainstream media has painted him as a crazy hiller. So it is perfectly understandable that the intelligence agencies, just because they're human and they happen to be on a side and they have been convinced that he's a monster that needs to be taken out, um, that all makes perfect sense to me. Wait, 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 it makes perfect sense to you that he would, I mean, to, just take the tweet of, uh, now it's probably 10 days ago, where he tweeted that there'll be a joint U.S.-Russia cyber alliance to figure out, you know, how to protect us going forward from cyber espionage. And people immediately joked, yeah, when, when is the, you know, the ISIS-U.S. alliance going to protect us against terrorism? And then he tweeted, you know, an hour later or a day later, essentially just kidding, or of course it's impossible, but still we got a ceasefire in Syria. You are describing those kinds of things as the actions of a master manipulator or persuader, but these are so obviously counterproductive. I mean, yes, they're destabilizing. If you're going to, as a general rubric, if you... Let me tell you what I, let me tell you what I think happened as in the most likely explanation for those, uh, those things which you just described. Now, one explanation, and again, any explanation fits the past, so that's always dangerous stuff. So your filter on it fits, which is he's crazy unstable. He sends one tweet that doesn't make sense, and then another one that cancels it out. So the filter that says he's crazy and unstable and you know, whatever fits those facts. Here's another one that fits. He tries a lot of stuff. He does a lot of A-B testing, including with the public. He probably thought about this idea and wondered if there was some way in which we could work together without creating any unnecessary risk. It took probably 24 hours for the people who do this stuff to say, no, there is no way to do that, even though maybe commonsensically it seems like there might be you know, some corner, some, some parts in the margin that we could work together. If we did, we wouldn't want to tell the public and we wouldn't want to do anything important. So then he says, well, we talked about it, but it can't happen and it won't happen. That's what his second tweet said. So to me, that fits the filter as well. A person who was open to an idea that was out of the box, which is why his supporters support him, because he does think out of the box in part. Uh, he considered it for a day. He got expert advice. It didn't make sense. He told us. Is that as crazy as it sounds? I mean, the problem is, Scott, everything fits that filter. I mean, if he takes his pants down in the Rose Garden and starts screaming, that will still fit the filter. He tried something. He's A-B testing. He's destabilizing everyone. Look, everyone's talking about that and not the oil pipeline he just rammed through or the, or the climate change agreement he just canceled or whatever. And you could always do this post hoc. Look, it's just it's, yeah. it's all it's all theater and, and it's working for him until he's impeached. Only impeachment would be a counterpoint here. Let me, let me agree with you as hard as I can, because that's the same point I was saying, that you can always explain the past with a variety of different filters, as we just did. That's not true of everything I'm saying. There's no explanation of him as an actually ethical person, as an actually honest person, as an actually well-informed person that you can run through the data. This, this, it's impossible. Uh, am, I try, am, I, am, I, am I trying to do that? I've never once tried to do that. Well, no, I'm just saying that. So like my analysis of him, my filter of him 
is falsifiable. I mean, the claims I'm making about him, that he lies to an unprecedented degree, that he is clearly uninformed where he should be informed, and failing to learn on the job the way we would want him to be. Well, but mo most of that both sides would agree with. So what you've said so far is that he plays loose with the facts, both sides agree, that his, if you look at his past ethical conduct, uh, both sides would scratch their head and say, mm, I don't think I would have done that in that situation. So we're, we're in complete agreement on those things. But he also said, I'm no angel, and I'm going to do for you, the country, what I've done to make myself so rich and successful. And by the way, it's a pretty public job, and you can watch, you can watch all along the way. And by the way, I've been lying about how rich and successful I am by a factor of 10, and that's why I'm not releasing my tax returns. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I'll bet he's worth $10 billion now. Yeah, well, that, that, to, that, that's proving my point. I mean, that's, that's the horror of the situation. He managed to make good on the con, to make it a non-con in the end, really. I, I, I will grant you that. But, but again— And that's, that's, that, that is exactly the skill set which he explicitly promises to use on our behalf, just like a, a lawyer is— But it's not on our behalf. Take climate change, right? This is not on our behalf if you think climate change is a problem, right? And, and if you don't think climate change is a problem, if you think you— are your own climate scientists because you did some Google searches, well, then you're just, again, you're, you've just migrated away from a fact-based discussion about reality. And this is not good for the country that we have a president who's done this. Take InfoWars. We have a president who has dignified Alex Jones as essentially better than, not only equal to, but better than the, the, the mainstream news media, right? And Alex Jones is someone who's been telling the world that, that the Sandy Hook massacre was a hoax so that Obama could come take our guns away. Absorb the ethical implications of that and the experience of the parents who are getting death threats for having faked the deaths of their children. And you've got Trump sitting down with him as though he's Ted Koppel. It's insanity that we have a president who beha is behaving this way, and you're, you're painting it as something that is just has no cost. Right? It's not only has no cost, it's probably a good thing because it's in our interest. No, you remember I interrupted you the last time you said no cost. I'm explicitly saying it has a cost. It has a cost to him reputationally, you said. It's a bad thing for everyone that Alex Jones has the president's ear. It's insane. And the I mean, I mean take climate change. I mean, what's your view of, I mean, for, forget about what you think about whether the climate change agreement we walked away from was going to do much of anything. We can debate that, but in terms of the importance, of isn't that? But that that debate's largely over, right? He, it turns out that when people looked at the climate uh, agreement, that it didn't do much. It just cost a lot of money. The, the narrow focus on that agreement is not the thing. The, the the focus is on getting the entire developed and developing world on the same page. That we have to address a global problem that no nation can address on its own. All right, but let, let's just look at it one part at a time. You know, he famously called climate change or climate science, I guess, or global warming a, a hoax. Yes. It turns out that the agreement, the, the centerpiece to the whole discussions, was closer to a hoax than a useful agreement. I, I would say that characterization was still hyperbole. You know, it was more like an agreement that didn't do much as opposed to an actual hoax. But we had been sold. I know I had been sold that that agreement would actually do something. Well, no, no, you're, you're equivocating on, on what, what is the hoax here. He said that climate change is a hoax. That like the the, the, yeah, the, I'm, the, the, the consensus. We're that now. Yeah, I mean, so that I mean, that's for, forget about the agreement. The problem is we have a president who will say things like climate change is a hoax cooked up by the Chinese to harm our manufacturing base. Well, hold on, hold on. Now. If you assume that he is underinformed and is in the process of becoming more informed, then I would say that he's doing the smartest thing I've ever seen a president do. And I know you're going to hate that because, you know, I talk about in the book you're reading, I talk about the systems being better than goals. One of the systems that apparently is coming out of his administration from the EPA is the idea of this red team, blue team uh, discussion on climate science which would have the benefit of educating the public. And here's the brilliant part. If it turns out that the, uh, that the consensus of scientists are spot on and, and everything they're saying, we should have listened to them harder, this red team, blue team thing is going gonna, is gonna to surface that. And it's going to allow the administration, including President Trump, to side with science 
once it has been completely communicated and vetted in a way that the public and the administration can understand. Because the alternative to that is to, for him to pretend he understands what science is saying. And I think that that, that is the big uh, dope trap that any of us think we, you know, well, in your case, you, maybe you can understand the science. But the average person you know, doesn't have any hope of looking into this field and penetrating it. But, but they don't have to. The point is, is it's not our job to vet all of the specific sciences that the scientists working in that field are doing nothing but vet themselves. And so when it's like people do things well, with climate science that they would never do with oncology or with anything else. I mean, it's like, it's like you're, you're not an oncologist, right? And when 97% of oncologists say that smoking causes lung cancer, you wouldn't be tempted to go on the internet and after an afternoon of Google searches, come to your own opinion about whether smoking causes lung cancer. That's not a move that people tend to make because if, for whatever reason, that's just not what people are, are politically let's, divided about. Let's use another example. Let's say the, the government's food pyramid um, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah, that's a, that's a famous area where the science is unsettled and also where the incentives to do science, where everyone's, you know, the, you got the Sugar Council doing their own science. I mean, it's basically like big tobacco funding their own research. So, so you would say that there are examples in our common experience in which the experts who had um, some career-related incentive to fudge things, fudge things, and fooled us for years that the consensus was right when in fact it was completely a hoax. W would, would you agree with that statement? With the food pyramid? With food, I had Gary Taubes on this podcast which proved to be surprisingly controversial. It's amazing how heated people get over this issue around food. But I would grant you that in the area of diet, and I'm sure that probably there could be some other areas we, we could think of, the consensus is unusually confused and has been for decades. And there's a lot to do to untangle the sources of people's confusion. And undoubtedly, there are bad incentives and poor research getting involved. But again, the, the cure for that is clearly more science. It's not a non-scientist getting a vibe by putting his finger to the wind or, or doing some internet research. But that's a straw man because there's nobody who is opposed to more science. But that's not true because this red team, blue team thing, this has already been done in the science. When, when you're talking about whether climate change is, is, is an issue. No, the, red, the red team, blue team thing, as I understand it, is a military process, Yes, which, uh, which does not have an exact um, you know, analog and peer review or anything like that. So it would be on top of the on top of the science. But, but my point is, you're, you're you're taking something from science about which there is very little controversy, and and whatever controversies surround it, it's at the margins. It's not about this basic issue, right? Well, if 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 that's your statement that there's very little controversy, can you point to the economic model that tells us both the costs and benefits? and when we should invest and what way we should invest to deal with climate. The economic model is the one that tells you what to do, how hard to do it, and when to do it. The science doesn't. Yeah, well, I mean, the, econ so the, the economics of it are obviously important to get as right as we can get them. And this is one of the real travesties of Trump's messaging here. I mean, Trump is talking about bringing back coal mining. Trump is the kind of president where Elon Musk has to resign from his advisory council for how embarrassing it is but to be me, hitched to him. So me, like, me, where's, the, where's the future? With, with 75,000 coal miners or with the 500,000 people in California alone who are in the alternative so, energy so, sector? Uh, as, as I mentioned before, my background is I've got a degree in economics and I have an MBA from Cal Berkeley. So I tend to filter things that way as well. Um, and... With the situation with uh, climate change, one of the uh, things that you always have to decide is, is when to start. And I had the, ex the same situation with my, uh, my house. When I built my house, I had to decide whether to put solar panels on the roof. Now, they said, if you put these panels on, they'll pay for themselves in seven years or whatever it is, 15, whatever. And I said, well, that's, uh, that's a terrible deal. Do you know why it's a terrible?
uh, hey, there's a bad thing coming. So we have to do, you know, some obvious thing right away. Lots of times it's more nuanced than that. Sometimes the best thing to do is to wait for your technology to improve, your visibility on the situation. Yeah, but then you have to improve the technology. But here, oh, here oh, we me, have a president who's cutting funding into basic uh, R&D let, science. Let, let, me, let me finish on the coal. Uh, the, the economist way of viewing this stuff is that when the economy in general is doing well, which almost entirely means jobs, you know, jobs equals the economy for the most part, um, that you have the freedom, the flexibility to solve whole kinds of problems. You know, it's, if your economy is doing well, you can do healthcare. That saves people. If your economy is doing well, your military is strong. That saves people. So, so to say that um, having coal might, or even reducing research, which seems like a bad idea to me too, um, that those things have this um, straight line negative impact in the future is just ignoring everything that economists know which is that building a strong economy and jobs is a big part, uh, gives you all kinds of options. It's a better system. But there's only 75,000 jobs in the entire coal industry. Not even, there's not even that many coal miners. It's everything. I mean, this is talking about people working in the, in the back office. And there, there are tenfold that many jobs, nearly tenfold that many jobs in clean tech in a single state, right? I mean, this is, everything is backwards here. No, we no, should be... no. Here, here's the persuasion filter on this. Do you remember before the inauguration when Pence and Trump went off to try to claw back those jobs from Ford and Carrier? And then, you know, it sounded like they did, but then the news came out, well, maybe, maybe that wasn't really what we thought it was. But what, hap right. what happened was they did what I call the new CEO move, <clears throat> new CEO move. And that is you, uh, before anybody even, you know, catches a breath, uh, on your first day, you make some big changes that essentially brand you for who you are. That was their way to brand them as the, we're gonna do anything to keep jobs in this country. That is the sort of psychology that drives an economy. Because if you think things are gonna be good tomorrow, you invest today, and it turns out that's all it takes for a good economy. So the psychology of the economy, uh, President Trump and Vice President Pence have absolutely nailed. And you can, you can see that in consumer confidence, you can see it in the stock market. So you're right that doing these little things with Ford, little things with Carrier, that might not even be the way they're reported, the, the saving a few jobs in, in coal, uh, you're right that the number of people is not important. But when you see your president clawing to keep people employed, clawing to keep jobs in this, uh, this country, you say to yourself, this is a country I want to invest in. But that, but again, it cuts the other way entirely for me and for half the country, and I think for anyone who's informed about the issues. And he could secure that exact same gain the other way. He could say, listen, I'm now president. I understand both how dangerous our situation is with respect to climate change and how much opportunity there is to make trillions of dollars if we seize this opportunity? Do we want China to be building all the clean tech or do we want to build it? I've just invited Elon Musk onto this advisory board. I'm going to be in close consultation with him and everyone like him to figure out how we can, we can ram through the 21st century in a few short years. And yes, there are coal miners who will lose their jobs, but here, there are 75,000 of them, and we can easily retrain them or find some other way to compensate them for the loss of these jobs. But clearly, the future is in getting our power from sunlight and in breathing clean air, not having tens of thousands of lung cancers and, and people dying from emphysema needlessly in our cities because we can't figure out how to transition to electric cars. I mean, forget about climate change. You could sell this entire thing on the basis of clean air. But no, we have a president who is gutting the EPA, right? We have a president who is, contrary to what you're saying, not seizing the economic opportunity. We should be doubling our R&D on everything related to the future of energy technology, and we're not doing it. Yeah. And he could sell it. He, he could do the exact thing you're, you say he's accomplishing by championing the cause of coal miners. Now, he could do the exact uh, same thing in a, in a clean tech well, frame. He could, uh, my understanding is he's, he's an all-energy guy. You know, you, you push, push open every door, and some of them will be better than others. So uh, first of all, I agree with you. There should be more 
emphasis on the future for all of the domains. You, know, you should be talking more about technology for healthcare, for you know, everything. housing, everything. Yeah. So I, I'm 100% on board that there's too much um, attention on the past and not enough on the future. But I would say that uh, his approach of giving attention to both to the extent that he can isn't crazy. But he can't. Again, it's a zero-sum contest between the past and the future here. Elon had to leave because it was such a scandalous association at that point. I perceive Elon as taking a significant personal and business risk by leaving because a lot of his business is based on government contracts. Trump could screw him. If Trump, who is this famously vindictive guy, if Trump decided to see his departure as a personal affront, he could say, well, you know, I, I, well, I'm going to do whatever I can behind the scenes to make sure the Air Force doesn't launch any satellites with SpaceX anymore, right? We're going to do it. We're going to find some other way to do it because, you know, Elon screwed me publicly. That was a principled stand he took because everything that, that was coming out of the administration was so beyond the pale. Maybe. I would say that it was more of a branding decision coupled with the fact that he's already running two or three companies and the last fucking thing he wanted was to attend meetings in Washington where absolutely nothing no, happened. No, There would be nothing better for him to have been riding shotgun on a presidency that was actually getting the points and connecting the factual dots with respect to climate change and the opportunity for clean tech. I mean, that, that would have been fantastic for him. And he, would, and let, me, he, let me ask you this. How would you feel, hypothetically, if this red team, blue team um, comes up with a conclusion that matches your own, which is, hey, it turns out that the consensus of scientists was right. And, and now we've finally communicated it in a way that even the government can get on board and say, yeah, this is some kind of problem we have. Suppose it came out that way. And then President Trump said, all right, we're going to change a few things now that we've confirmed this, but we still don't have an economic model. So as long as we're hedging, I'm going to do everything I can to keep the economy working because that gives us the most options in the future. Would that be crazy? At this point, the concern is, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to have some climate scientists on the podcast to really spell out this case, you, you know, closing every conceivable loophole at some point. But the, the concern among many climate scientists is just when is it too late to, to grab the, the knob and twist it in the right direction? I mean, we are playing this out over now the, the course of a full generation when we had many of the facts in hand decades ago. And, you know, we, it's like we, we don't have a lot of time to spare necessarily, and we're acting as though this is still a topic of uncertainty. Well, I, th I think there are a couple of problems here. One is that, um, and you can please fact check me on this, but my understanding is that climate scientists um, from, let's say, the 70s have been wildly inaccurate about what was going to happen in the future. Is that, but before I make my next point, is that, does that pass the fact checking or no? I'm sure there are predictions that have not come true, as, as are the case in any science, but I don't know if the, if the preponderance of what was being said in the 70s is now considered to be inaccurate. My, yeah, my understanding is that the people who were studying this stuff thought we were entering a, a global cooling period. So they, and then there was a period where I think it was Al Gore may have predicted that sometime about now Manhattan would be you know, flooded. So I, so I believe that there is a history that people on the right are looking at and saying, if you got it wrong all these times, uh, we have to at least, you know, be a little skeptical this time, you know, sort of fool me three times by the fourth time I'm going to start asking some questions. They don't know what's being claimed. I mean, first of all, cl global warming is probably the wrong phrase. I mean, we're, we're talking about climate change more than necessarily always warming. And we can even bite the bullet here that in some parts of the world, global warming would be a good thing. There are places that they'll, they'll suddenly be able to grow crops that they can't grow. If you live in Siberia, I think you could want nothing more than global warming. But the question is, we, we have a preponderance of the scientific community. I mean, the vast preponderance. We here are now talking about something like debating big tobacco about whether cigarettes cause lung cancer, who say... We have to get a handle on this. We are influencing the, the, this system in ways that we are increasingly understanding is going to produce highly non-normal climate response that will do things like 
flood coastal cities and raise the temperature and, and create extreme weather events. And all of this is going to cost a fantastic amount of money. And what's more, we have alternatives that have all of these other good things that come along with them. First of all, we'll no longer be paying these regimes in the Middle East to wage a, a, a global war of, of jihadist terrorism against us, right? We'll get off the oil, which couldn't happen fast enough. And you're talking about removing the main source of air pollution for the entire planet, right? It's just, it's, it's all good. Again, I'll grant you your point that there's better and worse ways to do this, and we don't want to start burning up trillions of dollars in the process. We want to find out how to transition in the most profitable way. But again, it's fairly clear to everyone who's thinking about this which direction you need to move to be embracing a, a sane, sustainable future. And it is not in just guarding the oil reserves uh, you know, under the Saudi royal family and extracting every last ounce but from those sands. this gets sands. us to the, the economic forecast, all right? If you're telling me that the scientists all align on the fact that CO2 is going to raise the temperature, I would say that's possible. You know? and, and in fact, uh, if you said, you know, gun to head, you got to bet on this, I'd say, yeah, that's probably true. You know, closed system, that's, you know, uh, it's probably true. Um, but if you say to me, therefore, we know the economics of when to invest, how to invest, uh, when to wait for new technology. You, I, I'm not sure if you see this, but people always tweet to me all the new tech, technologies for turning CO2 into you know, products and fuel and everything else. So if you said, what happens if we wait 10 years and the sea level has gone up an inch and you know, it's, a, it's a degree warmer, I would say, well, a bunch of places are going to be growing crops that they couldn't have. A bunch of places will be growing fewer crops than they were, that will cause some disruption, no doubt about it. But by then we might have technology that we can, you know, uh, just suck the CO. If we build it, if we build, I mean, China might have the technology. The question is, do we want to have a worldview informed by the best science insofar as we can understand it at any moment, or one that repudiates the best science for patently political well, correct, reasons? Correct, correct. Well, and that's, that's correct me. If, if this is wrong, but uh, as president, President Trump's administration has offered to expose the best thinking of scientists to the world in a way that never has been done before through this red team, blue team process, which they promised to televise. And you know, we get to follow along. Uh, and, and this is not a debate, by the way. The red team, blue team thing is not a debate where people say things and then you're out of time. It's, it's a process where uh, people get to go away, check their claims, come back later. You know, so it's far, uh, far more rigorous. Again, the, the, if, if all of that does something to change the administration's behavior, that would be a good thing. I can't argue that. But the fact that we have someone like Pruitt gutting the EPA betrays the actual bias of the administration, which is that environmental concerns are basically anti-business, and that we should just ignore the environment and extract every last lump of coal and ounce of oil we can out of the earth, because so I, the, what, I, the, dollar, the dollar you can have in hand now is better than the dollar you can imagine getting by, based on sunlight at some future date. Right. Well, I, one of the other tells for cognitive dissonance that I always talk about is turning a reasonable thing into an absolute. So it seems to me that the people in the EPA are saying, um, that it's better to have a strong economy, even if some of these rules might introduce some risk to some people within the economy, meaning that there might be different people who die because these rules are not in place, but there might be a greater number of them who have access to health care, you know, and, and you know, things which keep people alive. So to, to say that changing these things does nothing but cost is, I think, missing the fact that in economics, there's always a cost and um, there can be a benefit that's greater than the cost. Well, yeah, yeah. It's just that there's no argument that, that this is a principled search for those benefits. I mean, again, you could do the same thing with smoking. I mean, why not red team, blue team, whether or not cigarettes cause lung cancer? You know, we can get, get in the Wayback Machine and go back to that moment 
and uh, you know, let the me, science let me tell, is settled. No, no, let me tell you why. There's a very good reason. <clears throat> that would have been an excellent thing to do in, I don't know. 1950. Yeah, 1950s. Because the problem was that the country was divided. And right now with climate science, although the scientists are not divided, it's the perfect situation to educate the public because the administration is helpless until the public gets on board. Well, that's not true. I mean, the administration can do whatever it wants. I mean, as you as we've seen, Trump can, at at considerable reputational cost, just change his mind when he gets new information, and his fans, his supporters, will go along with him for the most part. As you said, if he decides not to build the wall because it's not practical, well, then you know most people will come along. He, that was just his first negotiation. But he doesn't need to take a hit to his reputation because he can do it in a way that improves his reputation while informing the public at the same time. And I think this red team, blue team process, once televised, will do exactly that. We're all going to be a lot smarter about this stuff. But let, me, let me make one point about climate science that I think is too important to gloss over. Uh, my view is that you can divide it into three categories, the topic, and you can assign different levels of credibility to each. One would be the basic science, you know, the chemistry, the physics. I would imagine that that is very high credibility, that we probably have a good handle on that stuff. Secondly, there's the building of models, which is something that scientists do, and they try to use all their best thinking, and people look at them. But by their nature, the complexity and the fact that at least some of the decisions uh, depend on human judgment, that's why there are different models and uh, lots of them, and they come to slightly different, in some cases, sometimes wildly different results, but they throw away the wildly different ones. Um, in that situation, if you didn't know even what the topic was, you know, so let's say you didn't know you were talking about climate science, you just said, a bunch of people who are super smart are building these complex models. There's bunches of them. Historically, a lot of them didn't work. Some of them actually match what we've observed. I would say to you, well, if you make enough models and you have some flexibility to, to change them, that looks just like my experience when I was doing financial modeling for a bank in which my boss would say, hey, make this turn out this way. And I would just tweak the assumptions until it did. That was my job. Now, I would say that the models have a lower credibility by their nature, I'm not saying how much lower, but I think you'd agree, a lower credibility than the basic science. And then there's the third thing, which I keep mentioning because it's so important, which is the economic models. That even if the, even if the scientific models of where temperature is going are reasonably, at least directionally right, there's still a gigantic question about the smartest way to play it. And it is not my assumption that the smartest way to play it is obviously and certainly to go aggressively, um, you know, to do the, well, take, take the example of the Paris Climate Accords. You know, even the people who were in favor of it after they saw the details at this point kind of agree, well, okay, it didn't do that much. So that the what you do about it is the part that matters, but you can't get to that until the public is sort of, you know, lined up, uh, you know, behind it. And I think that red team, blue team thing is the way to get there. Again, I mean, everything you just said sounded reasonable, but it doesn't sound reasonable coming from someone who just said that climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese, right? Like, like, like that's, that's the thing that's so highly and obviously non-optimal so about the let, president. Let me ask you this. So you, you know that he, he tells us he uses hyperbole to, to make his point. You know that he uh, says things during the campaign that are slightly different than the things he would say as president, because we we observe that to be true. He's, he's, well, he's not, I'm not so sure about that at this point, frankly, uh, because okay. he, he he didn't get saner as president. Well, he, well, he did, or much saner. I look at he backed off waterboarding. You know, uh, he backed off uh, deporting 10 million people all at once. He he backed off uh, the the going after the families of the terrorists. But then he accused Obama of of wiretapping him. He's just as much the loose cannon. He's just on to different topics. Well, even the wiretapping thing, the, the government is listening to all of our conversations all the time, right? So, well, so, so you well, can no. First of all, no. And, and second of all, for the sitting president of the United States to accuse the previous president of having wiretapped him, I mean, it's a very specific claim. That is one on its face crazy, but 
two and 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 crazy to allege without evidence. Wait, wait. But two, before you go on, would you acknowledge that when he says taping or wiretapping, he's speaking in a you know a general sense about monitoring communication? You would agree that that's. What I, I don't even think he. I don't even think he knows what he was saying because he put. He, I think it wasn't wiretapping in quotes. I mean, he's talking about Trump Tower being bugged. Right. Essentially. So, but I, I'm just. We're trying to make sure that we're on the same page here. You yeah. would agree that he meant that word to be generally monitoring communications. I'm just saying, imagine, um, uh, just imagine Obama coming into office and having immediately accused George Bush of having wiretapped him. I mean, it would just analogy? like. It, Are you giving me an analogy? Because it's more than an analogy. It's, it's, it's still the U.S. presidency. We're talking about the U.S. presidency at two different time points. It's such crazy, uncivil behavior. It's the new normal because of the chaos that he has introduced to our political system. I mean, we can't even focus on it because there's a hundred things like that. Scott, I, I see we're getting to the, the two hour mark here and I'm, I'm mindful of your time and I'm also mindful of, of when I'm going to lose this studio. I want to just pivot just for, for a second to the Russia thing because I think we kind of blew past it and I don't think we're going to you know, get into it very deeply. Obviously, the news is moving away from us uh, as quickly as a rocket ship at the moment. I mean, we're, we're having this conversation, I think, the day after the, the recent, you know, Donald Trump Jr. epiphanies uh, with his having given his emails to the public and everyone's having their reaction to that. Who knows what things will look like when, when we release this. But I just want to I want to bring you to your views on the Russia thing, because I, you wrote a blog post titled Russia hacked our election. So what? And you seem to believe, again, this is somewhat of a piece with your relationship to the climate science topic. You seem to believe that there's either some uncertainty about whether or not Russia did much of anything or whether it would even be wrong if they did. And, you're, I mean, and you seem to doubt whether Russia is really all that hostile to our interests or whether Putin is really that bad a guy or whether there's really anything here to be concerned about. And so I just want you to represent what, what, what in fact, you think there. Um, well, I think you have to look at this Russia thing in its individual parts, because they're not all equal. To the extent that if Russia hacked into um, any American servers with the intent of influencing the election, that would be a topic of revenge. In other words, uh, the appropriate response would be for our you know, spook services to pay back as soon as we can and in kind and you know with proportional force and the american public may never know what's happening there but we assume that i assume that that sort of stuff goes on at the same time it makes sense for the president not to be burning bridges unnecessarily because we're always doing this poking back and forth below the hood so you know being nice with somebody who who has uh, similar interests to us at least in terms of ISIS, at least in terms of North Korea, to some extent, uh, makes sense at the moment. So I think that in all likelihood, we don't know what's happening under the hood, what, the, what, our, what our cyber people are doing, but I would be astonished, astonished if the man who is most famous for revenge and never letting anybody get away with anything is, is letting this slide. <laughs> you know, he may wait for his chance, but I don't think he's going to let this slide. So you're not concerned that he has a, a double allegiance to, you know, either the, the Russians who have invested heavily in his properties or that he's in any way compromised by Russia so that, and, and that that explains how soft he has been on them and how incredulous he has been about this being a scandal at all, the fact that he would relate to this as fake news, you're, you're, that, you think there's just no there there? Um, I think it's not a one variable world. I think that everyone is influenced by all of those big factors. So he's influenced by wanting to do a good job. He's influenced by not wanting to lose face, not, not lose to Putin. He's influenced by, I'm sure, the fate of the Trump empire, but it's one of many variables that are swirling around. But what, what do you make of all the lie, like all the contacts with Russia that were all lied about until they were revealed? So you've got, and now the, the most recent one is, you know, Don Jr. So we've got him on camera on CNN or wherever it was, having to respond to the charge that they've had all kinds of contacts with Russia or, or, and representatives of Russia. And he says, this is an absolute lie. It just shows that, you know, my father's opponents will stoop to anything. 
And we know that he did that interview like hours after he just met with this Russian lawyer, right? So it's just like that we have him lying. Well, wait a minute. But we also know that the, that what they talked about was trivial. It had nothing to oh, do with the election. Okay, but he's, everyone in this campaign has been, been misrepresenting their level of contact with Russia. And it's only dribbling out. No, you just represented his level of contact. Yeah, well, his. his. You, I mean, but he's. You but you, you, you watch that on, interview. You, no, I can't. I can't let that go. You you yeah. suggested that that meeting had something to do with the Russian government, and it turns out it didn't. Well, no, it, no, it did because he believed that it did. I mean, the email, the email trail was him showing his absolute no. willingness to collaborate with the Russian government to get some dirt on Clinton. I mean, that that's. So, well, collaborate and collusion, you know. Well, is, is, I, I'm, I'm not even focused on, on the technicality of whether or not he's guilty me, of a crime. Me, I'm, just, me, I'm just saying that this. everyone's this. talking to Russia over there and they're lying about it. Again, the, 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 the starting position from Trump and everyone on down was there has been zero contact. That's their position. And yet they've had all this contact. Wait, wait. Did they say they had not talked with anyone who is a Russian citizen or did they have no contact with Russia as a, you know, their intelligence or their government? It has been every possible permutation of I've got nothing to do with Russia. I've got no investments in Russia. I've got no, no connection with Russia. I don't know anything about Russia. No one on my campaign has talked to Russia or any, anyone representing Russia. I mean, everything like that. Yeah. And do you think that 20 minute conversation that was about adoption or something. But it, no, it wasn't about adoption. The, the setup in the email was, we've got dirt on Clinton. You know, do you want to meet with us? And he said, I love it. I'll be there in five seconds. I got to ask you the same. How would you have handled that situation? Okay, no, but that's, that's a change of topic. I, well, I would, I would have called the FBI is the short answer. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if you called the FBI, and it's, let's say it's June and the, the election's coming up, suppose it was something vital, like it was important. Suppose it was oh, something please. that the, the voters wanted to know. Please. To take the, the, the actual uh, a, a relevant example, although probably a harder case was this, I believe, happened in 2000 with Gore, where some, uh, I don't know if it was hacked or just stolen material from the Bush campaign was brought to, to the Gore campaign. And they, without looking at it, apparently they called the FBI, right? So like, I said, no, we're not going to use this. This is illegal and this is unethical and we're not going to be part of this. I'm not imagining that everyone who does, you know, opposition research for presidential candidates has to be held to an ethical standard that I would hold myself to in, in my daily life. I, I don't have too many illusions about how dirty all of that gets. But here you have a, a known hostile foreign power intruding into our process, and that, let, puts, it, let, that puts it completely let, out of normal op opposition let research. Me, let, let me tell you how I would have handled it in that same situation. I would have first gone to the meeting and found out what they had. I, I would expect that it would be nothing because it's the sort of offer that you expect to be you know, exaggerated. So I would go there because my contact said I should, and you know, I'm just, you know, it's a personal connection of some sort. I would go there, I would listen. If it turned out to be important and something that law enforcement needed to know about, I would let them know, but I would also know what the information is first. Because here's the thing, if, if you turned it over to the FBI and it was something big, and I'm not saying it's likely that that would be the case, but if it was something big, because that's how it was alleged, you would have put the decision for who became president of the United States into the hands of James Comey. Because he well, would decide, no. well, he would decide whether he's leaking it or announcing it. That would be his decision, because you you've given the information okay, to him. But, but, but this, I mean, this, this is neither... Finish. Let me just finish. If, if, you, if you also knew the information, because you obtained it first, and then you said, oh my God, there's something fishy here, FBI get involved, then you also have maintained the option of letting the American public know this information if it was important. And I can't imagine as a voter that I wouldn't want to know important information. The important information here is that this concerted effort by Russia to influence our election in in every conceivable way through hacking through propaganda through I mean, it's just and those are those are quite distinct actions i would grant you but there's been a full court press to influence it to one end to install president trump right i mean clearly none of this has been in favor of clinton and what we have is a trump campaign and now a trump presidency that has stonewalled this 
at every opportunity, that has not tried to get all the facts out to put them in the hands of the American people, but to brand this as fake news, to brand this as a hoax, to brand this as 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 scaremongering that will that will lead to a war with Russia, right? There's all this there's all this talk about what do you want? World War Three? You can't be pressing on this door. How, how much time should a president spend? delegitimizing his own administration. It's not a matter of delegitimizing his own administration. I mean, I can tell you what he what he should have said before being president as a candidate, rather than saying, you know, I hope Russia hacks Hillary's emails because I'd like to re read them, right? Which is... Which you, you took that as a joke, didn't you? Did you take lock her up as a joke too? Of course. Did you... So when he said... When he said, "When I become president, I'm gonna I'm gonna get uh, together some lawyers to look into your situation," you didn't take that as an actual threat. I did not. You thought that that, that was a joke? Uh, not a joke. Uh, well, yeah, it was a joke because it got a laugh, um, but it was clearly hyperbole because it it, it, it didn't get a laugh. It, 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 it got cheers from people who would want to see that happen. Right? It got right. cheers so, from his partisans. It was a it was a crowd pleaser. Yeah, but but again, I would score this as a significant harm to our political conversation, and you would score it as you know your just something that pleased his base. Well, your your anyway, your assumption is that she was not guilty of anything that was worthy of. Oh no, I mean I, no, but my assumption no the the, the leave that aside. Yes, I, I assume she's not guilty of of something worthy of of prison time. Uh, certainly on that score, but. The violating the norm in our democracy, I mean, threatening that when if you win the presidency, you are going to lock up your opponent, that is in disastrously bad taste at a minimum for what it is to f have to function as a stable democracy and a peaceful transition of power. I mean, that's just way beyond the pale. I, I believe that uh, for a different kind of candidate, uh, I would definitely agree with you uh, pretty strongly. In the context of President Trump, who is well known by all observers to say stuff like this, uh, it, it does come across differently to me. Okay, so we, I just I just want to come back, and again, sorry, I'm I'm being motivated by time constraints now, but I just want to come back to your point that we didn't really answer my question about how you perceive all of this entanglement with Russia. He basically claims he's got nothing to do with Russia. None of his surrogates have anything to do with Russia. And then it just keeps coming out that his campaign had more contact with Russia in every conceivable way than anyone has ever seen from a campaign, right? So they, they, and they, there are clearly instances now where they have been lying about it. They've made false declarations on their security forms or most charitably incomplete declarations on their security forms. And then they have to keep amending the story. And I'm just wondering how you perceive this. I mean, what this is just some kind of strange accident that just doesn't look good, or there's just an entanglement with Russia that is potentially meaningful and undisclosed. So I'll, I'll give you the view from the right. Uh, the view from the right is that the mainstream media has largely uh, turned uh, a lot of nothing into something. Because if you look at, if you drill down into any one of these cases, they they sound like there's something until you get to the bottom and you're not so sure. Let me, I'll just give you a few examples. Let's say uh, we know that the IP addresses for the hackers of the DNC were Russia-based. So you say, oh my God, that's pretty bad. And then you hear a, an expert say, well, that's how you hide where you're really coming from. You just act like it's over in Russia. I have personally talked to uh, somebody who has used that trick to use an IP address in Russia for a different project. Uh, so technically that could be done. So I say to myself, okay, there might be something there and we should definitely find out what that is. But on the surface, it doesn't mean anything because- but, Okay, but, but what, what should mean something, again, this is analogous to what you're tending to do with climate science. I mean, so it's just like we have our intelligence, our full intelligence apparatus declaring this happened in, in a bipartisan way. This happened. It was Russia. You're not privy to top secret information, right? You don't know what they know. Why are you tempted to second guess how they have analyzed the IP addresses? Well, just because we don't know. 
And we know that there are. But they're saying they know. I mean, like, so I'll, this, I'll give you an example of where you would just never do this. I mean, just imagine if NASA announced today that there was an asteroid that was on an Earth crossing orbit. They're really worried about it, right? It, you know, their, their current calculations suggest that it could come within, you know, 5,000 miles of Earth, give or take 5,000 miles. And JPL and the other labs come forward and say, Jesus Christ, this is the scariest thing we've ever seen. This is a serious problem. It's all hands on deck. We got to figure out what to do about this. And you don't even own a telescope. You would not be tempted to say, you know what? You know, I, I haven't seen those calculations and I'm not so sure. I mean, like you, you have to outsource some of your reality testing to the people you've hired yeah, yeah. to do so, it for you. And in this case, we've got all these intelligence agencies looking at Russia. But would you also agree that we have notable examples where the intelligence agencies of have course, been dead wrong? Of course. But then the, the remedy for that is more and better intelligence. It's not the next tweet from somebody who will say, I just talked to Putin and looked into his eyes and he said he didn't do it. Uh, let, 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 me, let, me, let me finish my point because I think when you see the context, it'll make more sense. So if the intelligence agencies know stuff we don't know and they're right and, and Russia and its government was behind hacking the servers, that's important. And I would expect that our administration would pay them back in kind. And we may never know what that is. But the trouble is that you start lumping the things that uh, are real or could be real with the things that just sort of sound like they almost are kind of real. And, and then you start building this well when there's so much smoke, there must be fire. So the, the things that are less real, like the Don Jr. meeting that really I would have taken, frankly, I would have taken that meeting just to get the information in case it mattered. And then I would have turned it over if, if that was the right thing to do, turn it over to the FBI or whoever. Um, so I would have handled it the same way. And I would think any any seasoned business person would also handle it the same way. But then again, you're, you're wandering off the actual thing I'm asking about, which is not so much evaluating the quality of the intelligence about Russia. It's the fact that that we have an administration, we have Trump and everyone below him consistently representing the fact that they've had no contact with Russia or no contact that they remember with Russia. And it continually gets found out that they've What's had meetings that they, that they have, at the very least, not been forthcoming about, and which there's no credible reason to think that they would have forgotten about. So it's like, what, what do you make of the fact that there's that, that level of dishonesty about a connection to Russia? Um, so let, let's take some of those examples where we know for a fact that there were contacts. Uh, you're thinking about uh, General Flynn. I'm, I'm just thinking about all of it. Sessions, Flynn, Don Jr., the investments that we know happen that Trump is lying about. I mean, we've got the so, Sun saying that they've, they've got massive investment from Russia. And then we've got Trump saying that, you know, I, he never has Russian investors and got no loans from Russia and no business in Russia and all the rest. All right. So, so the, the business stuff, I, I haven't seen good, uh, good reporting on that yet, but I'll, I'll take your word for that. But we're, we're talking about the Sessions and Flynn and Don Jr.'s uh, encounters with Russians. Apparently, once we drill down, they were fairly trivial. In other words, nobody is suggesting that those things that they left off their forms actually were material. Now, again, I have to remind our listeners, we're having this conversation 24 or 48 hours after the story broke. And when you're listening to this, there's probably another week of reporting. So who knows what is true now? But Don Jr.'s email exchange which again makes it very clear what the the purpose of the meeting is and it was not the first thing that he represented when this was starting to leak out over the weekend and you've got Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort also in that meeting and also uh, sent the email right so it's the three of them these are like the, this is the top level people in the administration now going to a meeting that's billed as with an emissary of the Russian government to get dirt on Clinton and this is one of the meetings that they never disclosed and claim they never had. And we've got Don Jr. being interviewed about this topic that night, and he's saying that there's no contact with Russia, and what a scurrilous lie this is to suggest that there could be any contact with Russia. I don't know. I, I, I would have been tempted to leave that off of my but it's, form, too. Well, it's illegal. Reason, I mean, which is, hold on, hold on, hold on, because, because it was trivial, and it turned out to be nothing, and I was duped into going. So uh, I'm not sure I would have put that in my forum or even remembered it, frankly. Uh, okay. Well, I, again, to watch this interview with Don Jr., which we know 
came immediately after this email exchange and meeting is to be in the presence of someone who is absolutely lying about something they must remember, right? It's just, there's just no way, this, this is unforgettable. I mean, it's like me just, you know, getting on television saying I've never spoken to Scott Adams in my life. I mean, there's just no way to do it. So, Sam, he didn't see, he didn't say, I, I don't, I didn't watch yeah, whatever you, should, you saw. You should look but at I'm it. pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he didn't say, I haven't talked to anybody. Well, well, well no, but, it, but it's just the, the allegation didn't. was that the campaign <laughs> has been, in dialogue with the Russian government and that there's the Russian influence here. And, right. and, 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 and that example was him not being in well, dialogue with anybody. No, no, no. He, he was just fooled about the nature no, of a meeting. Please, please. He, uh, all right. We unfortunately are, are out of time and I will let our listeners adjudicate what, what sort of progress we made or didn't make. But the, the thing I most appreciate about this conversation is the tone and mutual goodwill and the fact that you went down this rabbit hole with me. And, you know, the, the goal here obviously is better understanding of ourselves and the world and, and how we can get to a good place. And I just think more of what are, in fact, very fraught and very hard conversations need to be had in this spirit of being willing to meet with goodwill and just uh, hash it out. I would I would say the same. I think you're a force for good, and I've been a big fan for a very long time. Um, and I, I I love what you do, and I love that you would have this conversation. Cool. And and I I should say there are many things. I mean, though we I said this at the top, but though we sound like we disagree about everything here, the moment we would make a lateral move onto other topics, we agree about so many things. I know. I mean, I know, just having read enough of your book, I know we agree about things like free will and the, the point you raised about goals versus systems. I mean, all of that's very interesting and could be the topic of a very fruitful conversation. Uh, and I would go so, for, so far as to say that when you read my new book, Win Bigly, about persuasion and about the election, that the gap between us will close substantially. Well, uh, I look forward to that, Scott, and I wish you all the best with what you're doing. And just give people your, your Twitter feed or whatever else you want them to know about where to find you online. Uh, that's at Scott Adams Says cool. Twitter. Well, thank you, Scott. To be continued. All right. Thank you, Sam. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and 